the limit as x goes to zero, sine cubed 5x over x cubed. We're going to be using the fact that the limit as x goes to zero of sine x over x is equal to one. If you ever forget this limit, it's easy enough to figure it out by using L'Hopital's rule, but it's definitely a good one to remember since it's used quite often. Okay, now over here, notice that we have a 5x up here and we're missing the 5 down here, right? And because everything's cubed, we're going to want a 5 cubed down there. So I'm going to go ahead and put the 5 cubed in. And to undo what I just did, I'll multiply by 5 cubed as well. We could either write that in the numerator or just next to the fraction. We're going to pull it out in a second. So it makes more sense to just write it over here. Okay, so now 5 cubed is 5 times 5, which is 25, times another 5 is 125. And since it's a constant, we could pull it outside of the limit. The, over here, we have 5 cubed x cubed, which we could rewrite as 5x all cubed. And remember that sine cubed 5x is just an abbreviation for the cube of sine of 5x. What's nice now is that all the uh, 5x's match up. There's a 5x here, a 5x here, and a 5x here. So we can replace all of them by some other variable name like u. Okay, so all I did here is I did a little substitution. I let u equal 5x. And just observe that um, 5x going to 0 is the same as x going to 0. So this substitution is okay in terms of where the limit is approaching. All right. Now I'm just going to bring the limit inside of the parentheses. We could do this by continuity of all the expressions involved. And then I use the fact that I mentioned in the beginning that the limit as x goes to 0 sine x over x is equal to 1. Um, x, the variable here doesn't matter. If it's, whether it's an x or a u, it's the same thing. This is just equal to 1. So we get 125 times 1 cubed, which is 125. The limit as h goes to 0, 1 over h, ln of 10 plus h over 10 is equal to I'm going to show you how to do this two different ways. First way is we're going to recognize it as a derivative. So first I'm going to use the rule of logarithms to rewrite ln of 10 plus h over 10 as the ln of 10 plus h minus the ln of 10. And since it's times 1 over h, that's the same thing as putting the whole thing over h. So maybe you already recognize this as a derivative. Right, so letting f of x equal ln x, remember the definition of the derivative is f prime of x is the limit as h goes to 0, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And for the function, we're going to use the natural logarithm function, right? So if f of x is ln x, then f prime of x is the limit as h goes to 0, ln of x plus h minus ln of x over h. Now notice there's a 10 here, so we're going to plug a 10 into this expression to get um, an ln of 10 plus h minus an ln of 10. And notice that it matches exactly what we're being asked to compute the limit of, right? So using the shortcut method, the derivative of ln x is 1 over x, so that the derivative at 10 is 1 over 10. Oh, and that's exactly what we're being asked to find here. Okay, a second way to do it is by L'Hopital's rule. So we have the limit as h goes to 0, 1 over h, ln of 10 plus h over 10. I'm just going to rewrite it so that um, this is the numerator and the h is in the denominator. Right? Same exact expression. And now I'm going to apply L'Hopital's rule. So to do L'Hopital's rule, you take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom. Derivative of the bottom is very easy. The derivative of h is just 1. For the top, we're going to need a chain rule. The derivative of ln of this is 1 over that, and then times the derivative of this, which is just, well, the 10 here is a constant, so we could pull it out. It's 1 tenth times 10 plus h, so that's 1 tenth times 1. So the derivative of the inside is just 1 tenth. Okay, now we can just go ahead and plug in the 0, right? And we just get 1 over 10 over 10 is also 1. So we have one tenth over one, which is just one tenth. Everything just reduces to one tenth there. Let the function f be defined by f of x equals, now this is a piecewise defined function. It's tan x over x for x not equal to zero and zero for x equal to zero. 
which of the following are true about f? Okay, let's look at the first one. The limit as x goes to zero, f of x exists. Well, so we have the limit as x goes to zero, f of x is the limit as x goes to zero, tan x over x. We're using this because uh, we're, we're approaching zero, so we're not equal to zero, right? So when taking the limit, you use this one. Now here we could just do a simple application of L'Hopital's rule, right? The derivative of tangent x is secant squared x, and the derivative of x is one. And now we could just go ahead and plug in the zero, right? Secant squared zero. Remember, secant is the reciprocal of cosine. The cosine of zero is one, and the reciprocal of one is one. So the secant of zero is one, and one squared is equal to one. So yeah, the, the limit does exist, and it's equal to one. Part two, f of zero exists. Well, yeah, f of zero is zero. It says so right here, right? f of x is zero when x is equal to zero. So that one is true as well. Now f is continuous at x equals zero. Well, the limit as x goes to zero, f of x we saw was one, and f of zero is zero, so these two things are not equal. The limiting value you're approaching is not what you actually get when you plug zero into the function, so this one is false. A 5,000 gallon tank is filled to capacity with water. At time t equals zero, water begins to leak out of the tank at a rate modeled by R of t, measured in gallons per hour, where R of t is 300 t over t plus one for t between zero and four inclusive, and R of t is 500 e to the minus 0.5 t for t greater than four. Is R continuous at t equals four? Show the work that leads to your answer. Okay, this one has a lot of words that aren't really necessary. It's just a continuity problem. They're just asking if that function is continuous at t equals four. So we have to check the limit as we approach four, and we have to check the value w when we plug in a four, right? So for the limit, we're gonna have to do a left and right hand limit because it's piecewise defined and it breaks up right at four. So the limit as t goes to four from the left R of t, where to the left of four over here, so we're gonna use this part of the function. And we're gonna just go ahead and plug a four in for t there at 300 times four over four plus one, which is, well, four plus one is five. Five goes into 360 times, 60 times four is 240, okay? And the limit as t goes to four from the right, r of t, is, well, to the right of four is over here. We're greater than four, so we plug the four in for t here, and we get 500e to the minus 0.5 times 4. Uh, negative a half times 4 is negative 2, so we get 500e to the negative 2. That is certainly not equal to 240, right? So the limit as t goes to 4 from the left and from the right, they disagree. They're not equal. So the limit itself as t goes to 4 does not exist. So since the limit doesn't exist, r cannot be continuous at t equals 4. Consider a differentiable function g with domain all positive real numbers, satisfying g prime of x equals two minus x over x cubed for x greater than zero. Find the x-coordinates of all relative minima and maxima, find all intervals on which the graph of g is concave up, and find all intervals on which the graph of g is concave down. Justify your answers. Okay, they're asking for a lot here. Let's start by looking at the derivative which was given to us right? So there's no work in finding the derivative. It was given. It's uh, just two minus x over x cubed. And it's pretty easy to see where it's zero. It's zero when x is two. That's what will make the numerator zero, right? And the derivative is positive when x is between zero and two, right? So test the number like uh, one, two minus one is positive one over one cubed. It's all positive, right? And g prime of x is negative when x is bigger than 2, right? For example, if you plug in a 3 here, you get a negative number up top and still a positive number in the bottom, right? So the derivative is positive coming to 2 from the left, and it's negative after 2. That means that it's um, increasing and then decreasing, increasing, then decreasing. So there is, in fact, a maximum at x equals 2. Okay, now for the second part, we want to look at the second derivative. The second derivative tells us about concavity. 
So this one, we're going to have to compute. This is a quotient rule, right? It's the denominator times the derivative of the numerator, which is zero minus one or just negative one, minus the numerator, two minus x, times the derivative of the denominator, three x squared, all over the denominator squared. The square of x cubed is x to the three times two, which is x to the sixth, okay? So let's just simplify that a little bit. We could factor out an x squared, and then we're left with negative x here, right? Negative one times x is left there. And we're left with the three here and the two minus x. We've pulled out the x squared there, okay? And let's see, that simplifies to, well, in here we have a negative six. So we have minus two minus six. The x squared cancels with the x to the sixth to give x to the fourth. We just subtract the exponents. And when you factor over here, you're left with two times x minus three. So the second derivative of x is zero when x is three, right? You could see that from the numerator here. Now, the second derivative is negative when x is between zero and three. Again, we could just plug in, say, uh, two. You'll see that two minus three is negative, and the denominator is always going to be positive for x between zero and three. So the second derivative is negative. And for x greater than 3, if you plug in like a 4 here, 4 minus 3 is positive 1, and everything else is going to be positive, right? So the second derivative will be positive for x greater than 3. So since the second derivative is negative between 0 and 3, the graph of g is concave down there. And since the second derivative is positive for x greater than 3, the graph of g is concave up for x greater than 3. Consider the differential equation dy dx equals y plus 1 over x. Describe the region in the xy plane in which all solution curves to the differential equation are concave down. Okay, so again, for concavity, we need the second derivative. So we're going to take the derivative of what's already given, because we're already given the derivative. So if we take the derivative one more time, we'll get the second derivative, and we'll be able to answer questions about concavity. So... Again, we have a quotient rule. It's the denominator, which is x, times the derivative of the numerator, which is just dy dx plus 0, or just dy dx, minus the numerator, which is y plus 1, over the derivative of the denominator. The derivative of x is just 1. Um, so that was times the derivative of the denominator, which is 1, all over the denominator squared, which is x squared. Okay? Um, so just replacing dy dx by what it's equal to in terms of x and y, we can replace dy dx by y plus 1 over x, and uh, y minus 1, uh, y plus 1 times 1 is just y plus 1 there, okay? So we can now uh, cancel the x here with the x in the denominator to get y plus 1 minus y plus 1. Oh, and that's just 0 over x squared, which is just 0. So the second derivative is zero. Since it's always zero, it follows there are no solution curves which are concave down. The region is empty. Let h and k be twice differentiable functions such that h of one equals negative four, h of eight equals six, k of negative three is one, and k of two is eight. Let f be the function given by f of x equals h of k of x. That's the composition of h with k. Let b satisfy b is between negative 4 and 6, exclusive, not including the endpoints. Explain why there must be a value a for a between negative 3 and 2, exclusive, such that f of a is equal to b. All right. So first of all, h and k are differentiable. In fact, they're twice differentiable. But in, for this problem, we actually only need that they're differentiable. So that implies that they're both continuous, right? Differentiability always implies continuity. And that implies that f is continuous because f is the composition of two continuous functions and that is always continuous as well. Now, f of negative three is h of k of negative three, right? Which is, well, k of negative three is one. So in place of this, we could put a one. And then h of 1 is negative 4, right? So f of negative 3 is negative 4. f of 2 is h of k of 2, 
which is, well, k of 2 is 8, so we get h of 8, and h of 8 is given to be 6. Great. So since f is a continuous function, right, satisfying b is between f of negative 3 and f of 2, right, b is between negative 4 and 6, which is f of negative 3 is negative 4, f of 2 is 6, right? The intermediate value theorem guarantees that there is a value a with a between negative 3 and 2, the two inputs, right? Such that f of a is equal to b. Okay, so I'm going to draw a picture of this so that you can see exactly what's going on here, right? So we have a, f is a continuous function. That means to get from any point on the curve to another point, we can't have any breaks or jumps or any, um, there, there are no discontinuities, right? It's continuous. So we have um, f of negative 3 is negative 4 here, and we have f of 2 is 6, right? So the intermediate value theorem says that between f of negative 3 and f of 2, right, if you take any number between that, so here's some uh, y value b, that there has to be some a such that f of a is equal to b. That's the intermediate value theorem. That makes sense because there are no breaks in the curve, right? So the full statement of the intermediate value theorem is that if f is a continuous function on the interval jk, here jk is negative 3, 2, and b is between f of j and f of k, so our f of j is negative 4, our f of k is 6, and here's b somewhere between there, then there is a real number a with a between j and k, j here is negative 3, k is 2, such that f of a is equal to b.